Good evening. Welcome to our Wednesday evening services here at the Benton Church of Christ. Um, I have a few people on the prayer list that I'll read over at this time. Tammy Rudd was taken to Baptist Health Hospital last night with health issues. She is in room 333 and is having tests run at this time. Potter Children's Home is asking us to join them in 30 days of prayer for all the children. Each day there is a specific topic to pray for and printouts for this uh, can be found in the foyer. Please continue to remember New Pathways Home for Children in your prayers. If you're interested in finding, finding out how uh, you can help with this, see Jessica Lovett. All right, that's all I have on the prayer list. Let's go ahead and have a prayer at this time. Lord, we thank you for this day and all that you've blessed us with. We thank you for this time that we can come together in the middle of the week to assemble and worship you. We ask that uh, you be with all those that we've read over that are in need of your care at this time. We ask that uh, you be with any others that of our number that may not be here because of any sort of health-related issue. Please restore their health if it be your will and bring them back to us. We ask that you be with each one of us tonight as we uh, go into our classes and study more about your word. Please be with the teachers that are uh, teaching out of your word. Please let them be able to recollect what they've studied and uh, bring a practical lesson to us that we can apply to our lives. Thank you for all that you do for us and through Jesus we pray. Amen. Uh, the general announcements that I have, this one says, Thanks to everyone in the congregation who have given donations for Bibles in Benin. So far we have collected $3,084, which will purchase 385 Bibles for the Benin brothers and sisters in Christ. The Lone Oak Church of Christ is having their annual area-wide fellowship day, and this will be Thursday, September 27th from 9 o'clock to 1 o'clock. Please join for a day of fellowship, fun, and a wonderful meal. Uh, and the church bus will be going to this. If you need a ride, you can sign up on the sheet on the bulletin board. And if you need any more info on this, you can see Jane Hines. There will be a sisterhood meeting on September 17th. Um, at, here at the church building at 6.30 at night. And please call the office if you have any questions about that. Um, if you weren't here last week, we have started our regular Wednesday evening services. Uh, there's a class here in the auditorium taught by Mark Ray. There's a, a class for young adults in the library taught by Scott Phillips. And uh, there is a women's class in room 50, taught by Jody Westerfield. And there's a class called 30 Days with Jesus for Adults in room 51, taught by Jared Morgan. Uh, this Sunday night, September 23rd, we'll have our services outside in the pavilion. So please remember that, and there will be a potluck to follow. Announcements for the youth group. There will be a meeting in the youth room tonight after class for anyone going to the teen week retreat. And don't forget to check the four-year bulletin board for flyers on other activities that aren't listed on this. Uh, tonight, Mike Darnell will lead our singing and Brent Lentz will have our message. All day long of Jesus I am singing, he my song of joy will ever be. All the while he keeps my heart bells ringing, for his love is everything to me. He my king, and so I dearly love him. He Oh, nice. 
Good evening. When's the last time you cleaned out your closet? In Acts chapter 20, we read an interesting story about the Christians in Ephesus cleaning out their closets. The prelude to this story comes in verse 13, where we read the curious story about the seven sons of Siva. These were guys who were exorcists, and they were going around trying to cast out demons the same way Paul did. That is, by invoking the name of Jesus. And in verse 15 it says, They came up on a demon-possessed man, and they said, In the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. And the demon replied, Jesus I know, and Paul I've heard of, but who do you think you are? And with that, the demon attacked the men and gave them such a beating that the seven sons of Siva ran out of the house naked and bleeding. It's a humorous story until recently. I hadn't really looked at what happened afterwards, but that's where our story is tonight. The, this had a tremendous effect on the inhabitants of Ephesus. First, it says that the non-believing Jews and Greeks held the name of Jesus in high honor. They recognized that there was something special about the name of Jesus, and they regarded it highly. Second, it says that a lot of the Christians came forward and brought the books that they had previously used to perform black magic, and they burned them. The books were valued at over half a million dollars. It seems the converts to Christianity in Ephesus had not totally given up their previous pagan lifestyle. Some of them were still practicing black magic, and some of them maybe weren't practicing black magic, but they were not willing to let go of the books that had formerly been part of their lifestyle. Maybe they liked to look at the pictures, or maybe they thought they'd be collector's items someday, or maybe they wanted to hedge their bets in case Christianity doesn't work out. It doesn't really say why they held on to the books, but for whatever reason, they held on to the books. But the episode with the seven sons of Siva made them realize that their former lifestyle was not compatible with Christianity. They, need, they realized that they needed to make a total break from their pagan practices. They needed to clean out their closets. So tonight, it's time to clean out our closets. I don't know what it is in particular that's in your closet that you need to get rid of, and you don't know what it is in particular in my closet that I need to get rid of, but God knows what's in our closets, and we need to clean our closets out. So pornography is an obvious um, analogy to this story, and if you have pornography in life, we certainly need to get rid of that, but this is not just limited to pornography. There are other things in our lives that we need to get out just like the citizens of Christ in Ephesus did. So whatever we have in our lives that is inconsistent with the, Christ, with the Christian lifestyle, we need to stop hanging on to it. We need to get rid of it. So we're fixing to sing an invitation song, and if you have something in your closet you need to get rid of, I'm not asking you to come forward for the invitation song. I'm asking you just to get rid of it. Take care of whatever's in your closet. But there may be some in our audience who need the prayers of the church for some other reason. And I'm inviting you to come forward while we sing this song. Or there may be those in the audience who are like the Jews and Greeks in Ephesus who held the name of Jesus in high honor, but they had not gone total commitment to Jesus. They had not put on the name of Jesus in baptism. They had not become Christians. So if you want to become a Christian tonight, we also invite you to come while we stand and while we sing. forsaken, betrayed by all. Hearken what meaneth the sudden call. What will you do with Jesus? What will you do with Jesus, my friend? Neutral you cannot be. Someday your heart will be asking, oh friend, Someday you're 
our classes.
Bibles to the book of Ecclesiastes. We're going to keep our study going, talking about the meaning of life. And as we get going through Ecclesiastes, we're in chapter 1 and verse 1. Last week, we looked at sort of an introduction. And we talked about how you could follow uh, the books of wisdom, especially three of them, Proverbs, uh, Song of Solomon, and Ecclesiastes. And a lot of people say that you can follow Solomon's life going through that. Proverbs is a very positive book with very positive lessons. Um, let's finish some of them. Train up a child the way he should go when he is old. What? He's not going to depart from it, okay? Trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding in all of your ways. Acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths, right? Okay, so you go through that and it's pretty positive. Now, of course, Proverbs is a little bit different than what we read of in the New Testament and other passages or other books because they're Proverbs. Proverbs are sayings of wisdom. Now, uh, they are general sayings of wisdom. And so there's sometimes where you can train up a child in the way he'll go and that child just turns into a booger because of free moral will or because of the influence of other people or whatever else. And he doesn't follow the way of the Lord. Now, some people say, well, wait a second, if I raise my child up and he doesn't follow the way of the Lord, does that mean the Bible's wrong? No, it's a proverb, which is usually true, right? Uh, what are some proverbs we know of that aren't in the book of Proverbs? A stitch in time saves what? Okay, it, good. I'm in an older class, so y'all remember that one, okay? Uh, penny saved is a... Man, y'all knew Benjamin Franklin personally. All right. So we go through that and look at that. You see those Proverbs, general truths. All right, so that's what you see in Proverbs. But it's a very positive outlook on life. If you do this, this will happen, that sort of thing. Now, Song of Solomon's a different beast. Many people say that comes in the middle of Solomon's life when he is finding all of his women and he is in love, right? Now, Ecclesiastes seems to be written by Solomon when it's later in life. And you can see a man looking back, and he sees his life a little bit differently than Proverbs. Things don't always go the way they should. And maybe if you visit with somebody in a nursing home, or you visit with somebody who's older, they look back on life, and maybe they're not necessarily negative, but they look back and they see, they know some people who have suffered who didn't deserve to suffer. And they know sometimes things just don't go the way that you want them to go. And the Ecclesiastes goes in that way. Now, when we cover chapter 1 and chapter 2 and chapter 3, these first couple of chapters, man, they're tough to cover because it is hard to have a positive outlook as you're going through some of these things. Because what he's doing is he's starting a search for meaning, and he's talking about how many of the things which people depend on today don't turn out the way that we think they're going to. And what he's doing is he's leading us to chapter 12, where he reminds us, you follow God, and God will take care of you. But we're not quite there yet. All right, if you have an outline sheet, uh, you can see there what you have on one side, I think it's on the right side, is the uh, chapter on the front and the back. That's the New King James Version. Uh, I don't pick that version because it's the best one necessarily. It just seems to be a good average one that most people in the congregation would have that's kind of close to what they cover. And then on the other side are just some comments that I put together. Um, looking at our first comment there, the words of the preacher. Does anybody have a different translation which says something else besides preacher? A teacher? Okay. A lot of people will, when they're educated, use the word koleth, which either starts with a Q or a K, depending on how you like your Hebrew. But uh, what it means isn't necessarily a preacher or a teacher it's more of a sage uh the the word or um, the word literally means a collector or a librarian and so the way solomon's presenting himself here is here's a guy who has researched all over the place has studied his entire life he is a repository of knowledge and he says okay i have done all these things 
now I'm ready to talk to you about how life is. I'm ready to talk to you about how things are. And so think of a librarian that has their library memorized where you walk in and they know exactly where every book is and exactly what every book is about and all those sort of things. That's that idea of the word kuloth or the idea of the word preacher or sage which is coming across. So Solomon is saying, listen, I've lived life and I can tell you exactly what it is that you need to know. And here's what it is. What's verse 2 say? What's that key word there? Let's see it five times, right? Vanity, okay? Vanity of vanity, all things are vanity. Nothing is more than vanity. Now, we see the, the key word there, vain. It kind of comes across differently. It's more like grasping or trying to attain something that you're never, ever going to get. Uh, another way that he puts it a little bit later in the uh, chapter is grasping for wind. You can imagine somebody who's out there and they can feel wind and they decide they want to stop it or they want to just grab it and send it in another direction. And no matter how hard they grab, no matter how hard they try to get a hold of it, you just can't get it. It's something which you can see it if there's enough stuff in the air, you can feel it, but you just can't grasp it. And that's the key word of the whole book. You're going to find it all the way through. I think I've said it's found 29 times in the book, or 29 times in other verses. So it's 34 times in all. And he's talking about how trying to find meaningful, something meaningful in life just absolutely isn't worth it. It's hard to find meaning in life. Now, you see some other passages which use a similar thought. Mark 8, 36 through 38, passage I quote pretty often in preaching. What would it profit a man if he gains the whole world and yet loses his own soul? Or what would a man give in exchange for his soul? Okay, um, James 4. We find that our life is really nothing more. Don't brag about what's going to happen tomorrow. Don't brag what's going to happen in the future. Because James says your life is nothing more than what? A vapor. Your life is nothing more than a vapor. Now, what's James talking about there? When he says life is just a vapor. Yeah. You know, it may look significant for a short time. Like maybe like a large fire, you know, really fills the sky with smoke. Ten minutes, it'll be gone. Uh, sometimes it's something which you can barely see. But whatever it is, it's just so quick. It just disappears so fast. And James says, that's what your life is like. Don't think you're going to live forever. Don't think that you're in control of the world. You better follow God is what James is saying. And in the opposite way, that's what Solomon's saying in chapter 1. He says, it's vain. My life, your life, our lives are vain. You have all the money in the world. He'll say later in the book, what happens when you die? Do you take all the wealth with you? Somebody else gets it, and they spend it on something you didn't want to get, right? There's a preacher down in Tennessee, an African-American preacher. And one of the phrases he likes to say all the time is, every one of us is just a heartbeat away from a cheap yard sale. <laughs> all the things that we love, all the things that we treasure, our kids are going to be selling it for pennies on a dollar because they don't love it the same way we do. And so often the things that we think are so important and the things that we base ourselves upon... It really doesn't matter. You may love your job, and it may be the best job in the world, but the day you retire or the day you leave, what happens? Somebody else gets that job, don't they? Same with money, same with possessions. Everything is just a grasping. What you think is important, right when you put your grip on it, is just going to disappear. And that's the key to what we're looking at here in Ecclesiastes. It's just a vain thing which is there. And so he's going to go through there. Um, look at verse 3. What profit has a man from all the labor which he toils under the sun? Okay. The question is repeated four times. Uh, the gist of the question is this. If life makes no sense, pleasures of life are so fleeting, why bother living? That's what he's saying here. Solomon near the end of his life, pessimism in a sense had taken hold. The common belief is that Good things happen to good people. Bad things happen to bad people. We've kind of taken something out of Buddhism called karma. Have you ever heard of karma? What is karma? Good karma, bad karma. 
It's different than putting your couch in the right place so you get the right energy. What's karma? Right, right. That person who zips right past you on the road, you get to pull up beside them at the next red light and just smile at them, right? That's karma. Uh, the person who says something bad to you ends up tripping and falling over. That's karma. He deserved what he got. Hey, listen, if I help the little old lady across the street, that's good karma. Something's going to happen good to me. If I pay, pay it forward and pay for somebody's lunch at McDonald's, you know, Rich people eat at McDonald's. Uh, pay for somebody's lunch at McDonald's, right? Then something good will happen to me because I help somebody else. That's our idea of karma, right? Does karma always work out? No, we're not Buddhist. The karma thing doesn't work out. Now, we think it should, and a lot of times we feel like it should, but it doesn't always. And so that's what he's talking about here as he goes through. And so let's go ahead and read verses 4 through 11. We'll come back and look at some things here. One generation passes away, another generation comes. The sun rises, the sun goes down, and goes back to the place where it arose. The wind goes towards the south, turns around to the north. The wind whirls about continually and comes again on its circuit. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full to the place from which the rivers come. There they return again. All things are full of labor. Man cannot express it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor is the ear filled with hearing. All right, we'll just stop there. Now, a lot of people really like this part of Ecclesiastes because they say Solomon, in his foreknowledge, saw the wind cycle, how the wind works around the earth, and how it generally has prevailing winds and things such as that. And many people say, we really didn't figure that out until Columbus finally got a lucky strike that pushed him across the Atlantic. And other people say, wow, look, there's the water cycle. And so he had to supernaturally understand how water works, the evaporation into the clouds and the rain and going down to the rivers and that cycle, which is there. But you go through that, Solomon's making a point. And here's the point. Now, again, this is the depressing part. Solomon says, I watch a drop of water. Say it hits a continental divide. It hits on this side, so it eventually ends up going to the Mississippi River, goes to the Gulf, goes out to the Atlantic, evaporates and comes back and ends up being rained right back in the same place. And that drop of water just goes over and over and over. Or he says, I imagine I'm just a molecule in the wind. Now, this is before we figured out wave theory. But he said, imagine this wind's blown there and then it goes around the side and comes back and blows right over again because of the cycle. It's a never-ending thing. And he says, I sit up and I look around and I notice you and I, we live in a never-ending cycle. Now, we touched on this last week. Our congregation here, the Benton Church of Christ, in the year 2022, we are 100 years old, which is really cool, isn't it? All right, 100 years ago, were things new? No, everybody was old back then. They saw everything in black and white, right? Well, you know, it was new to them, not new to us. But what did people worry about 100 years ago? Pretty much the same thing. There's some other issues. World War I was just completing a huge flu epidemic. Different things like that. Uh, we were entering into the Roaring Twenties, getting ready to go into the Great Depression. But generally, people were worried about their kids, because starting in the roaring 20s, kids were acting crazy. It's a flapper craze to start, right? Kids were not behaving the way they should. They were kind of weird, right? They were worried about economics. They wanted to feed their families. They wanted to make things work. They wanted to try to get ahead in life. A lot of mechanization was going on in the area around us. There was a lot of things like that. Now, we come to the present day, and today we have cars, more so than they did in the early 20s at least. Today we have these wonderful things, right, that tell time and lets us put pictures back and forth and this and that and whatever else as we go through. We have telephones, we have jets and everything else. But generally, what is it we worry about? Raising up our kids, taking care of them. Instead of being the flappers in the 20s, today we got millennials, right? But you start comparing the two, they're really pretty similar. You're worried about providing for your family. You're worried about trying to, uh, worried about what's going on in politics maybe or whatever else. In 100 years, 
Okay, there will be even greater technology, hopefully, right? Well, what are those people going to be worried about? Pretty much the same thing. Their kids will be dumber than our kids, right? They may not call them millennials, but they're going to be doing something else. Solomon looks at that. And he says, I arise, and every generation that arises, we'll talk about this more later in the chapter, every generation that arises, we think we're the most important one that's ever come along. And we think, man, our generation is the best generation. And our generation, boy, we have done a lot. But guess what? What's going to happen in 40 years? Another generation will rise up, and what will they think? They think the same thing. And what Solomon's looking at is he says, you know, just like that water cycle, and just like that wind cycle, and just like that seasonal cycle, he says, it happens the same thing here. And while I may live, and I may think things are really important, and I may feel like we quoted Steve Jobs last week, talking about how he said, I want to make a dent in the universe. He says, really, I look around and I realize these things that I think are so stinking important, it's grasping after the wind. There's just nothing there. And these things that I'm stressing about and worried about, these things that matter so very, very much to me, he says, you know, these things don't matter. We aren't quite as unique as we want to be. Now, You'll meet a Jehovah's Witness person every once in a while. They love chapter 1, verse 4. The earth abides forever. Now, is that saying that the earth will never be destroyed? 2 Peter 3 is pretty certain about that, right? John 14 is pretty certain about that. He's talking about in the, from the perspective of generations. The earth is here. It's still revolving even after we're gone. Okay? So many people are restless. If you look at the very end there. One of the questions they ask, and maybe you don't ask this question as much as I do, why am I so tired? You ever feel tired? Does that happen to y'all? I've got two new boys in the house, so I've got four boys, 18, 18, 16, and 13. Rhonda, bless her heart, has three weenie dogs. I've got four dogs. Honestly, we walk the dogs and the coyotes, and I'm like, come on, coyotes, come here. No, not really. Don't watch this, Rhonda. All right. You know, I'm just like, oh, man, why am I so tired? Okay? When I'm old and looking back with those grandkids on the lap, and I look back there, and am I, am I going to be proud? Are there going to be things I can talk about that I've done? Why am I burned out and disillusioned? Why is it when I go through, life just doesn't work the way it's supposed to? Sometimes we say, what is to become of me? Am I going to be okay in retirement? Am I going to be okay in a few years? Is everything going to work out the way that I think it ought to work out? This is what Solomon's getting into. Now, like I said, we don't cover Ecclesiastes very often because this is a can of worms that we're not really... Um, excited about getting to. We like the Philippians 4, rejoice in the Lord always, always be a person of peace, you know, always rely on God. We like looking at it from the positive side. Solomon here as as an old man is looking back and saying, hey, I've lived life. I've had everything in the world there is to have. I've enjoyed everything there is. And man, at the end of life, none of this really matters. None of this really matters one single bit. Okay? Look in there at verse, verse 8. I, he says, I cannot express it. The eye is never satisfied. The ear is never filled, right? You cook a big dinner tonight. Guess what the family wants tomorrow night? They want to eat again. Isn't that crazy? No matter how much you watch, there's always some more to watch. No matter how much you hear, there's always some more to hear. Maybe you've been to Vegas, maybe you've been to Metropolis, maybe you've been to Tunica, wherever there's a lot of gambling. If you have, repent, but that's a different sermon. They got the nickel slots, the quarter slots, the dollar slots, right? Why do people keep putting that in there and pulling that arm? They do it just repetitively almost the whole day. What is it they're looking for? The big payoff, and they always think it's coming when? That next one is going to get me. That next one is going to do it. All right. A lot of people spend a lot of time on Facebook, right? 
why do we spend time on Facebook? There's not always a lot of information there, but you always think, man, if I refresh it one more time, I'm going to come across a great article. I'm going to come across a funny joke. I'm going to come across some sort of picture, right? And a lot of people just stay on there because they think, okay, in just a little bit, this is going to come up. In just a little bit, this is going to happen. And it's this idea of I am just at the cusp of getting there. I'm just at the cusp of something which will satisfy me. Those are two examples I have. Gambling, Facebook. Do you have other examples? Maybe eating potato chips. I don't know. But there's always that thing which is there. Now, as we look at that, no matter how much you study, no matter how much you hear, guess what? Do you ever learn everything there is to know? Isaiah puts it this way, God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts as the mountains are above the earth. So his ways are higher than our ways, right? Jeremiah says there's a way that seems right to man, but that way will lead to death. Because it's not God's way. Now, verse 9 is interesting. A lot of times we'll come across and we'll say, I don't know about that. There's nothing new under the sun. Well, how different is life today? And then it was in Solomon's day. You probably did not ride in your chariot coming up here, right? Okay, maybe a Model T, but not the chariot. All right, you probably didn't come to to church in your robe. If you did, we got issues, right? There are new things. But what is he talking about here? The daily things that we're worried about. When you boil it down, who we really are. When you and I look, how much of what we deal with is going to be remembered in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years? Some people mentioned to me last week when we talked about genealogies. Some people can go back in their genealogies 100 years, 200 years, all the way back to the 1600s. But honestly, in a few generations, what are people going to know about us? Maybe our name, maybe the date of birth and death, maybe who we married and children maybe, if they're really looking into it, our occupation. And, of course, pictures may survive now. But really, how much are people going to know about what we've gone through? Now, there are some people we remember, presidents, great inventors. But so often, Solomon says, I look around at life, and the things that I think are so important maybe aren't as important as I thought they were. They're grasping after the wind, the things that I'm looking for. Okay? So verse 13, Solomon says, here's my job. Here's my task. This is what I'm going to pull off. Why has God left us with this life? Why has he left us with this translation, New King James, says this burdensome task. Okay? Uh, The Hebrew literally says, why did he leave me with this bad task? venture which is here in other words a bad deal why did he leave me with this bad deal that's here he repeats this question or this statement twice chapter 4 verse 8 15 verse 14 now what's he talking about this bad deal we look at life and a lot of times people don't get the things they deserve good people get a cancer diagnosis good people get laid off at the plant. Good people who've raised their kids right have children who don't always do what we hope they would do and fulfill the potential that we wish they would fill. Sometimes we try as hard as we can on a project and it just doesn't turn out. And we don't feel that so much when we're younger. You know, when you're graduating from high school, you feel like you can conquer the world, right? Right? But man, when you get up there at 60, 70, uh, you look back and man, some of these things you tried just didn't work out the way you wanted them to necessarily. And Solomon says, here is my goal. This is what I'm after. I'm going to study and see why this happens. And what this book is written about is to explain why God does things the way that he does. Now, we see some passages here. Job 14.1, you'll have all these memorized Job 14, 1, man who is born of woman is what? A few days and many what? 
many sorrows, many troubles. If you're born today, you don't live as long as you think you're going to live. Because those years go by faster and faster as you get older. And it's tough. So read there in Genesis 3, 16, it talks about women and many of the physical issues that women have. In Genesis 3, 17 through 19, this passage especially applies to me, I think. He's talking to Adam, and he says, you're going to sweat on your brow. And he says, in everything you grow, only thorns will come up. You ought to see my garden. Right? That really applies to me for sure. Well, what, what's the curse there? Because of Adam and Eve's curse, because of our sins as well. This is a fallen world. And things don't always make sense to us the way that we think they're going to. And things don't always go the way that we want them to go. And so Solomon says, I'm going to study this. I'm going to see exactly what can be done to make these things right. Make these things go the way they should. Verse 14, I've seen all the works that are done under the sun. And again, they're nothing more than a grasping after air, a grasping for the wind. 15, there's two ways of looking at it. So I wrote them down both different ways. The first way of looking at it, what is crooked cannot be made straight. When something is bent, it can never be put back in its way. And what some scholars say when they look at this is no matter how good the king may be, there's always going to be injustice somewhere in the kingdom. No matter how good we try to be, there's always going to be something falls short somewhere around us. A lot of commentators will point to that and say, man, that's what we're talking about there. Another one, and maybe it's more reasonable, is when you make a mistake in life, no matter how much you repent, no matter how sorrowful you may be, sometimes there's still consequences that you've got to pay. And sometimes there's still issues which are there. Now, it doesn't feel like it to us that it should be that way. When a person is sorry and a person repents, God ought to make everything right again, and we ought to be able to just go on with life like nothing happened because our sins are washed as white as snow. Remember that? But that's not the way life works. There's still consequences which are there. And you and I remember the old camp illustration, right? Whether it's WKYC, West Kentucky Youth Camp, or maybe somewhere else where the guy will have a uh, piece of board up there at the front. And the job is everybody is to put a nail into that board, you know, and so everybody practices the nailing. Well, the nail represents the sin. The board represents our life. You and I can repent of our sin and have that nail pulled out. But even though that nail is pulled out, what remains? the scar or the hole that's there. Solomon perhaps here is saying, listen, when we sin, when things are made crooked in our life, it is hard to ever make it right again. You ever had a time where you, in a conversation with somebody, lost your temper? Or maybe you were joking around a little bit too much and you said something. As soon as you said it, you thought, wow, I should not have said that. And you apologize and say, I take it back, I didn't mean it, and everything else. Are there still some residual con uh, problems from that? Yeah. What's crooked can't be made straight sometimes. And so that's what Solomon's talking about in life that comes across and something we need to. And so, verse 16, this is Solomon talking. I communed in my heart and I said, look, I have attained greatness. I have gotten more wisdom than all who were before me in Jerusalem. And my heart has understood great wisdom and knowledge. All right, so you look at Solomon. Here is the guy who is the test case. If anybody could tell us about the purpose of life, it's Solomon. Solomon started off his life as good as you can be, as rich as you can be, building the largest building which the world knew at that time, the temple. Right after he did that, he built his palace, which was even larger, right? Is the guy that God came to and said, listen, I'm going to give you more wives than anybody else has. I'm going to give you more knowledge than anybody else has. I'm going to give you more power than anybody else has. It got to the point where silver was just like dust in a road. Everybody had so much money that they really didn't care about it. Everything was just too great, and he was holy, and he had everything in the world which you could ever want. 
But then Solomon changed, and he went against the God, and his kingdom had some issues as well. And so Solomon says, listen, I am the test case person who can test this out because I have been righteous, and I've seen what life is like. I have been unrighteous, and I've seen what life is like, and now I'm righteous again. I have tried it every way in which you can. And so see there, verse 17, he says, I tried wisdom, that's following God, and I also tried madness and folly, that's following the ways of the world. You ever look back to when you were in high school or whatever and said, man, I wish I would have gone this direction or would have gone this, with that direction or whatever else it may be? I always tell my kids when they're going through high school or college, join every club that you can, play every sport that you can, uh, make every relationship that you can. Because in 20 years, you're going to be lying about being on that football team, right? Okay, maybe not. You know, what happens in high school, you're on the bench all the time. And then once you go to college, you tell people you played every once in a while. And then once you're in your 40s, you tell them you started. Maybe that didn't happen to you, but that's what happens to most people. Well, you know, it, look for the opportunities to enjoy life. Look for opportunities to do these things. And Solomon says, I have been there. I have done it through everything that it is. I have tried everything. And what Solomon say when it's all over? What's the theme there in the end of verse 17? Is nothing more than what? Grasping for the wind. That is absolutely all that there is total. When I was in high school, our football team at, at the school where I grew up was a pretty good team. You know, they were, they were pretty good back at that time. Well, let's see, I'm 45. I was a star. In, no. I played only when we were 40 points ahead. It was the only time I ever got to play. But it was a pretty good team, you know. And, you know, in my life, that mattered a lot. That's all I cared about. And I can still recite the scores of most of the games that we were in, right? A few years ago, I guess we're looking at 10 years, maybe 9 years. I don't know. They made a movie about that football team. And I remember going back to the movie premiere. Everybody at that movie premiere was fat, old, and bald. And I looked around and I thought, man, I hope I'm not that way. And I saw a mirror. And, well, okay. But, you know... You don't think about how much things change, and you don't think about how insignificant those things that were so important to you were back at that time. But it's just interesting seeing how those things work and how those things are. Does, do those things matter anymore? No. Not a single bit. Nobody cares about it anymore. And so that's what Solomon is saying. Now, let's go ahead and close here in verse 18, because it's an interesting verse, okay? For in much wisdom is much grief, and he who increases knowledge also is going to increase sorrow. All right? As some of the superheroes would say, with, with much ability, with much talent, also comes much responsibility. Solomon says, I want to warn you before we go in this trip, as we look at life and examine life, you're going to see a lot of things that don't line up the way they should. And a lot of people are very shallow in their thoughts. And they go through life and they believe this karma stuff. Hey, if I do good, good things will happen. If they do bad, evil things will happen. And as long as you're shallow about it and don't study those things out and really watch close, they're happy, right? Right? And Solomon says, but you begin studying and you find out God doesn't always do things the way we want him to. And God has not meted out to each person exactly what they deserve. And sometimes when we start thinking that through closely, when someone we love gets sick, when somebody we respect has trouble, when we ourselves don't get what we deserve, sometimes we can look at that we get angry. Let me say, God, why in the world are you doing this? Like Job. But in chapter 12, we're going to see it does make sense. But it makes sense on God's terms rather than our terms. And so we've got to recognize that God is God and we aren't. And we've got to recognize that God will see us through as we remain faithful. Okay, as we come to our close, any comment or anything? I pretty much talked the whole time. Huh? 
of the word Ecclesiastes, uh, it comes from a Latin word, which means many words. Ecclesiastical is talking about the making of words. It's like a long book. It's pretty much what it means. But it comes from a Latin, Latin thing. Many words are a long book. The great words that the kuloth or the preacher would have gathered together in his library. Remember, we talked about last week, and this is something a lot of people don't know necessarily. The Epic of Gilgamesh is quoted in Ecclesiastes. Uh, some of the uh, writings which are found on tombs in Egypt are quoted in Ecclesiastes. Now, that's not proof that Solomon wasn't inspired. What is proof of is this man studied a lot. Because hundreds of miles away, he had read those books. He was familiar with what was there. You get to chapter 3, you see a lot of quotations from these different places. This man wasn't just writing off the cuff. This was a very well-researched paper that he was working through. Are there any other questions? All right, now what do we always say when we get out of here early? Don't run in the halls, okay? All right, thanks for being here. <laughs>